It is something that all regular and not so regular exercises have experienced. Muscle pain and soreness in the days following a particularly hard training session. It is the price paid for the benefits exercise, especially resistance training, can have on growing muscle mass and strength, stability, glucose tolerance and even bone density. Now the list of ways that people deal with exercise induced muscle soreness is indeed long. But in this podcast, I'll explore one aspect, and that's how protein helps with the recovery process and how it can be doing you good, even if the aches and pains don't feel any less. A small amount of muscle pain and soreness after exercise, that isn't related to an injury of course, is a good thing, as it is a stimulus for the body to repair, adapt and grow stronger. And while that soreness means your body is giving you feedback that the last training session definitely was doing you some good, it can go too far if that pain persists for several days, which may delay exercise recovery and limit future exercise quality. Some estimates put acute muscle soreness and swelling as able to reduce muscle force generating power by half, which can persist for several days. This is a more extreme case as regular training sees a reduction in this damage. Although it can be an arms race where a dedicated resistance training program would see progressive increases in exercise load, repetition range or volume, thus imposing new exercise stimuli and greater susceptibility to muscle damage and soreness. And even mild symptoms of muscle soreness and weakness could diminish a person's motivation to exercise and reduce the frequency or the quality of exercise sessions. So what to do about it? And no, not getting off the couch in the first place isn't the answer here. The strategies to help address muscle soreness and damage after training would keep me in business for months on end doing podcast after podcast episode on each of them with most approaches lacking any clear evidence that they will help. Massage, stretching, foam rollers, compression garments, electrostimulation, ice water baths and anti-inflammatory medications all feature. I'm even starting to see interest in flotation tanks to help with recovery. Then there are the nutritional ones that can have a food or supplement focus. Antioxidants, fish oil, curcumin, fluid, carbohydrate refueling and the list goes on. And then of course, there is the benefit of rest and a good night's sleep in helping the body do what it needs to do. And that one certainly will help with recovery at least. But one that deserves a special focus is protein. It would have to be the number one nutrient at the forefront of the mind of athletes, especially those with a resistance and strength training focus. Without adequate protein, it will affect the gym gains. So that's why sports people have higher protein requirements with numbers going from 1.6 up to about two grams per kilogram body weight often quoted. One important role of that extra protein is helping to repair damaged muscle. So could getting plenty of protein in the pre and post exercise period help in reducing muscle damage and soreness? And despite extensive research, the evidence for peri-exercise protein supplementation, that is consuming protein in the pre, during or post-exercise period, in helping to reduce exercise-induced muscle damage is quite mixed. The variety of exercise protocols, protein dosing and timing regimens, participant characteristics, dietary controls and measurement tools employed all likely contribute to these diverse findings. So now we have an attempt to characterize this mixed bag of research into one study by way of a meta-analysis. This was a review of 40 clinical trials where supplemental protein was consumed before or after exercise. Whey protein was the most common protein source used, either alone or combined with carbohydrates. But other protein sources were also consumed and these include soy, egg, pea, casein, and collagen protein. To measure how supplemental protein could aid recovery from exercise-induced muscle damage, the participants performed a maximal voluntary contraction under isokinetic, 
meaning constant speed, or isometric, meaning constant muscle length conditions. Isometric testing involves measuring the force that a muscle can generate against an immovable object, such as a wall or a force plate. While isokinetic testing involves measuring the force that a muscle can generate while it moves at a constant velocity through a range of motion. Isometric and isokinetic tests of muscle function are considered the most valid and reliable tests for assessing exercise-induced muscle damage. And these tests were performed at 24 hours, 48, 72 and 96 hours after resistance training. The researchers also looked at the effects of supplemental protein on levels of creatine kinase, which is a blood marker related to exercise-induced muscle damage, and where high levels indicate more muscle damage. And on top of all that, participants gave subjective ratings of their muscle soreness. And I'll link to this review in the show notes. So what did they find? Taking on additional protein before or after exercise saw less impact on the detrimental effects of exercise on maximal voluntary contraction under isometric conditions at 96 hours. And for isokinetic conditions, benefits were seen of the protein supplementation at 24, 48 and 72 hours after resistance training. So that's good news for the functional effect of protein on reducing muscle damage and that the muscle can bounce back quickly to its pre-exercise potential. And to validate this, there was also less creatine kinase measured in the blood after 48 and 72 hours under conditions of protein supplementation. And the effect size, which is a measure of the real world effect of protein supplementation, was rated as moderate to large. So we're talking about very meaningful results here as far as affecting someone's performance and recovery. Yet, despite all this, supplemental protein did not improve people's subjective ratings of muscle soreness after resistance exercise at any time point. So people were still feeling the burn for some days after exercise, despite clinical evidence their muscles had recovered well from the damage. As with any review that combines a bunch of studies, there were issues. As with most of the exercise science literature, research is severely overly biased towards male participants, with few women in the studies. And there is a clear difference between males and females with anything to do with muscle function, which is further impacted by hormonal effects. And most of the studies use young people, so it is unclear how the results may apply to older exercises. Another limitation is that the control group in each of the studies were not always the same, as some of the studies didn't replace the protein with a similar amount of energy from a non-protein source. And half of the studies were in trained individuals, and the other half in untrained individuals. But the review didn't discuss if there was a difference in outcomes between these groups. So my take on all this is that firstly, there is already strong support for the role of additional protein in athletes and recreationally active individuals. And this research supports the benefits of that protein on muscle repair and recovery after exercise. And by extrapolation, longer term muscle growth and adaptation. It's just that that extra protein you're taking on around the exercise period may not do much to help with your perception of muscle soreness, which is the price of entry for those muscle gains. And this all now leads me into the final part of the podcast, and that's to do with the timing and dose aspect of protein supplementation. Optimal muscle growth and recovery are more than just about meeting daily protein needs. And this is where the concept of protein timing around exercise has some credence. Each time protein is consumed, there is a small spike in muscle synthesis with a dose of just 20 to 25 grams of high quality protein sufficient to stimulate muscle protein synthesis following resistance exercise. Having these protein doses 
spread throughout the day can help to maximize exercise-induced muscle growth and aid the repair of damaged tissues. Eating quantities of protein above that 20 to 25 gram range in one sitting offers only a limited additional benefit, with a very minor 10% further protein synthesis when the amount is doubled to 40 grams of protein. However, Despite the common recommendation to consume protein as soon as possible post-exercise, evidence-based support for this practice is actually currently lacking. That doesn't mean that it shouldn't be done, only that it shouldn't be treated as gospel despite what the bros at the gym may tell you. How long the mythical post-exercise muscle anabolism window remains open for is hotly debated, but it likely exists for several hours. So, fear not, gym goers, your muscle gains aren't going to shrivel away because you didn't chug down your protein shake within five minutes of your last set of bench presses. And there is a nice commentary paper on this topic of protein timing published in 2013, which I'll link to in the show notes. So, let's wrap all this up. Combining all the protein timing research together leads to the conclusion that the body likely responds best to regular small doses of protein throughout the day. I like to call this new muscle growth and recovery optimization protocol regular meals and snacks with a focus on higher protein foods. Others may just call it eating. So that's it for today's show. You can find the show notes either in the app you're listening to this podcast on or else head over to my webpage at thinkingnutrition.com.au and click on the podcast section to find this episode to read the show notes. If you find this podcast of value, then please consider sharing it with your friends and colleagues or maybe even leave a review. This all helps increase the ranking and reach of the podcast, which means a big win for credible evidence-based nutrition messages and making the world a slightly less confusing place. I'm Tim Crow, and you've been listening to Thinking Nutrition. Thinking Nutrition.